Hello. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Hi. Um, good evening. Um, my name's Helen Colley, if you don't know me, um, and I lead the Structures Week at HKA. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the Structural Expert Deconstructed. Um, this is our Structures first, but hopefully not last, panel discussion. Um, sorry to disappoint, we're not going to actually physically deconstruct a human on stage, um, <laughs> if you thought that was going to happen. But the aim of this evening really um, is to share with you some of our insights into what it means to be a structural engineer, first and foremost, um, and how that translates into working as a structural engineering expert. Um, while one never really wants to dwell on challenges, it is important for us to acknowledge the challenges of expert work so that we can best serve you, our clients. Um, for whom clear, concise, well-reasoned and unbiased opinion is critical to, to a successful outcome. For the technical disciplines, and I include our infrastructure, architecture, MEP and fire engineering colleagues here, um, some of those challenges arise directly from the nature of the day job. As I'm sure you know, construction projects are complex beasts. We'd like to explore that idea in the following talks, presenting an exploration of what structural engineer, engineering is, um, when it might give rise to disputes and how this team, um, the structures team, decodes all of the complexities of those structural issues. Um, before we'd, we start, I'd firstly like to introduce and thank um, Sarah Kite and Konstantinos Lytos in particular, um, who have kindly stepped in at short notice to fill the shoes of Martin Hicks. Um, Martin is in the midst of a very intense adjudication and sends his apologies. Um, Constantino is part of our delay team and Sarah, our digital and BIM expert, um, will delve into how the delay discipline in particular um, can and does rely on technical um, evidence. I would then like to induce, introduce all of my team from around the UK, um, some of whom will be speaking, but all of whom will be around after the talk for a chat, so please do um, look for them. Um, so I've introduced myself, Helen Colley. Um, we have John Bird on the panel. If someone could stick their hand up so they know who everyone is. Um, Paul Burrell, who's in the audience. Um, Philip Ebbotson, who's on the panel. Uh, Dennis McClatchy, who's in the audience. Um, Panos Strasakis, who's on the panel. Um, all of whom are chartered structural engineers, and some of us are also qualified civil engineers. Um, those of you who've worked um, with us since 2020 will also be familiar with Sharon Stephen. Hands up. Um, who's in our expert support team, assists us all, um, and probably now knows far more about structural steelwork and concrete than she would like to. Um, during the talk, we'd love for you to ask questions, but um, if you could save them until the end, I think that would work best, um, unless you have a burning query, in which case, please put up your hands, um, and I will apparently be roving with a microphone at the end to take questions. Um, I look forward to catching up with many of you afterwards um, and drinks will be served just behind us. Um, and on that note, I hand over to my colleague Panos to kick things off. Thank you, Helen. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Panos Rousakis. I'm a senior engineer with HKA uh, based in London. I'm a civil, I'm a chartered civil and structural engineer with over 14 years of experience in structural design, predominantly um, in building structures. I will kick off our tonight's presentation by running through the role of a structural engineer uh, in, the in the design process, how changes and design coordination um, may cause issues and lead to disputes and the role of the uh, forensic engineer. Now, what is structural engineering? Generally speaking, is a branch of civil engineering that is concerned with the structural design of man-made structures. However, if I quote the words of Dr. Dykes, who was the uh, chairman of the Institution of Structural Engineers, Scottish branch in 1976. 
Structural engineering is the art of modeling materials we do not wholly understand into shapes we cannot precisely analyze so as to withstand forces we cannot properly assess in such a way that the public has no reason to suspect the extent of our ignorance. Now, I personally like this definition by Dr. Dykes because it highlights the complexities that are inherent in our profession. But uh, before we touch on those complexities, I would uh, like first to give you a brief overview of what is required to, uh, for someone to become a professionally qualified structural engineer. Um, the starting point of, in our career journey is an accredited degree in an engineering discipline. Attributes that structural engineers must possess include a strong grasp of physics, three-dimensional conceptual skills, and creative problem solving. Because of the safety issues that are involved with our line of work, we must be trained to strict standards. Hence, there is a minimum requirement of four years of professional postgraduate experience, which must be peer reviewed. Our end goal is to become um, what is known in the UK as a chartered engineer. A chartered engineer is an engineer with, who's registered with the Engineering Council in the UK, which is the uh, reg regulatory body for engineers. Um, the title is protected by civil law under the Engineering uh, Council's Royal Charter and can only be used by individuals that's there on the register. Structural engineers work with uh, work towards professional qualifications, becoming chartered members with either the Institution of Structural Engineers or the Institution of Civil Engineers, or both. Um, the Institution of Structural Engineers, it is famous for its seven hour chartered membership examination, which has an average, average pass rate of 30% each year. Now, we've covered the uh, training and professional qualifications of a structural engineer. So we will talk about the design process and the role of a structural engineer in it. Design is a process of synthesis, whereby the design team focuses on developing a solution from a suit of potentially viable alternatives. The design solution must meet the client's requirements while respecting their constraints. The design team, which is typically involved in, in a project, comprises the architects who defines the form and the layout of the building, the MEP engineer who defines the services required, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and of course, the structural engineer whose job is to define the structural form of the building and ensures that the loads are transferred safely to the ground. I earlier talked talk, talk about uh, design requirements and constraints. So in the course of the design process, we typically need to consider design requirements, such as appropriate risk of failure, fire and corrosion protection, openings and fixtures, buildability and maintenance. In terms of design constraints, we typically have to work around architectural and geometric limits of the project, environmental and ground conditions of the site, serviceability and cost of the project. Now we're going to touch on the structural design as a, as a process itself. And what we typically do is to identify appropriate loads for the design to include gravity, wind, seismic, construction loads, identify the path for the loads to be transferred to the ground, identify the effects of that load path on structural elements. Generally, complex geometry leads to complex load paths in a structure, which requires complex structural analysis. We consider failure modes like bending, shear, compression, and ensure that brittle modes like shear are not the ones to occur first. We aim to optimize the use of materials for sustainable development. And of course, we ensure that compliance is generally achieved with the building regulations and the applicable design standards. Now, there are some structural engineers who may specialize in seismic design, whose purpose is to design structures to withstand the largest earthquake of a certain probability that is likely to occur at their location, but without collapsing. Seismic design involves complex analysis of structures um, and is used to 
simulate the dynamic nature of the seismic events. And because of this very dynamic nature, loading from seismic events is never the same. So for design purposes, we have to rely on probabilistic or statistical processing of historic earthquake records. Structural design can be affected by changes which may occur for myriad reasons and may originate from client changes, requests for information, requests by the contractor, construction sequencing, workmanship issues, unforeseen conditions, as well as error, errors and omissions. Changes to design can be difficult to incorporate and they can have a more wide ranging effects than are evident to a known engineer. For example, a load change at one end of the roof can alter member sizes on the other end. So it is imperative for the structural engineer to assess the impact of any change um, that is made on the design before agreeing to it, because depending on the change, it could lead to a fundamental change in the structural concept. Um, sometimes presence of engineers on site can be invaluable in ensuring that design changes are implemented correctly during construction. Another key aspect of the design process is design coordination. In principle, all decisions that are made within the design team they should best accommodate all of the requirements of all the members of the, of the design team. Depending on the complexity of the project, fundamental design changes and or lack of coordination between disciplines will inevitably give rise to issues such as construction errors, clashes leading to delays and additional costs, and eventually to disputes. Sarah and Constantinos will further elaborate on this subject later on. Um, this is the stage, obviously, where forensic structural engineers get involved. Forensic engineering is primarily concerned with the detailed examination of events contributing to a problem. It requires a specialized skill set, com a combination of lengthy experience, an analytical mind, a determination to unravel the problem, and an ability to communicate in clear and concise terms. Forensic engineers investigate the cause of a defect in a particular material, component, procedure, mine, or, or structure, and determine whether this defect was foreseeable by a competent and experienced professional. Piecing together the um, design of a structure that forms part of a dispute requires consideration of all the complexities involved in structural design, as we discussed earlier, and all this should be based on verifiable evidence. This usually involves a desk study of all the available case documentation, including contractual agreements in order to understand the obligations of the parties, any other design documentation such as as-built drawings, specifications, design reports, um, condition survey reports, and other documents. Um, John will cover these in more detail later on. Now, depending on the nature of the dispute, site surveys and further intrusive investigations are sometimes required, which will involve detailed visual inspection and opening up of the uh, structure of the building. Having talked through the role of structural engineering design and forensics and the complexities involved with them, I will now pass over to John, who will cover the challenges relating to communication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pados. As introduced earlier, my name is John Bird. I'm a technical director based out of the Birmingham office. I've over 25 years of experience of working as a structural engineer prior to entering the world of expert work. I'm uh, a chartered civil and structural engineer and a fellow of both institutions as well. I'm also, I also serve as a chief examiner for the exam that Panos mentioned earlier with the really low fail rate. The objective of, of my section of this is to reflect on the challenges faced by the technical expert, in this case, structural engineers, in describing what could be highly technical issues in clear and concise terms. 
So this quote by a, a, a former president of the Institution of Structural Engineers, and I really like it because it, it speaks about how a solution can't just be technically right. It also needs to be at the right time and communicated clearly, otherwise it loses value. So there's a lot going on in the head of a structure engineer. An awful lot of things, as you can see there. Structure engineers have a lot to consider when they're designing a building. Design codes of practice and software has become increasingly complex as we've sought to innovate and also save on materials. But despite having all these things going on, structure engineers aren't exactly renowned for being great communicators, like say, for example, architects are. My colleagues looking happy now. Uh, this is partially due to the fact that a lot of structure engineers have a very analytical brain type, but also in fairness, due to the fact that it is very difficult to describe some of these issues clearly because they are so complex. So uh, this is an example. Uh, this is an aerial view of some steelwork fixing for uh, a concrete slab. So for a layperson, this might look a bit chaotic. A structure engineer can look at that and see complete sense and order. They can see the design intent. They can tell you where reinforcement is missing, where it still needs to be fixed, et cetera. And they can even visualize the 2D drawing that, uh, that is being produced from. So there's an awful lot going on in the head of a structure engineer but getting that information out in a clear format can be a challenge. So starting with a structure engineer in practice, they have to communicate in several different ways. Starting from hand sketches, not my sketch, by the way, one of my colleagues in the audience, I'll, I'll let him own up to it. Through to uh, CAD drawings, building information modeling, 3D, 3D modeling, but most importantly, in meetings with the client, the design team and on site where clarity of communication with the structure engineer is so important. In 2020, the Institution of Structure Engineers uh, released a plan of work for, uh, prim primarily for the UK. And this, this gives a framework under which, uh, which governs how structure engineers but, um, uh, deliver on projects. It, so it defines the roles and deliverables and, uh, and at what stage they should be delivered throughout the reader stages of the project. Some typical deliverables are shown there. So you can see there's, there's quite a wide ranging type of deliverables there and communications from reports, drawings, appraisals, all sorts of things. So I've mentioned building information modeling or BIM briefly earlier. So BIM has been one of the biggest developments in terms of how design teams work together. BIM will make everything far easier, allegedly. BIM does allow different disciplines to, to work together, to uh, join models together, to coordinate and resolve issues. The potential for efficiency and resolving errors before they actually happen is, is obvious. But importantly, it still requires really good communication, it requires coordination, cooperation, and an organization to, to operate uh, correctly. So uh, we've spoken about BIM, which is drawing modeling. Structure engineers obviously do analytical modeling as well. And that software has also evolved and become more and more complex. So moving on to that, um, CROSS is, uh, stands for Collaborative Reporting for Safer Structures. It's an anonymous forum that uh, structure engineers can report to. And the idea is that rather than issues being swept under the carpet, they're there on a forum other engineers can learn from it. Really good forum. So on the UK site, I did a search using one word, software, and yielded 43 results. So there's a selection of four of the results there. And as you can see, they relate uh, to all sorts of issues, including um, from the software being defective to people using the software incorrectly. So there's quite a lot of issues there. There's, so the software can be clever and complex, but it requires the right input and it requires a careful check of the output. Structure engineers have long used a, an expression, garbage in, garbage out. So specifications are a really interesting point. On every project, a, a structure engineer will produce a specification or a set of specifications. And my experience is that they hardly ever get read. 
other than two circumstances. One, if a subcontractor has to do a design as part of the project, then they read the specification they have to, because it defines what they're doing. Or when there's a problem, at which point everyone goes to go in for the specification. If you take the same information and put it on a, onto a drawing, people read it, they query it, they understand it, and they execute it as part of the works. So there's exactly the same information, just presented differently. So this, this here is a, a great example of design coordination gone wrong. What you can see there is a reinforcement cage for a foundation. And sat on top of it, that's a bolt box. So it's the holding down bolt assembly for where a column would be fixed down. It's not meant to be sat on top of the reinforcement like that. It's meant to be within the reinforcement. And uh, so this, this was a re obviously a real life situation. You can see the photo uh, called to site and the structure engineer's view is well, obviously that needs to be fixed within the reinforcement at the same time you're fixing the reinforcement. The steelwork fixes view, well, nobody told us that. We made all those cages off site and lifted them in. And besides, look at that reinforcement. How on earth would you fit that in? It's far too congested. The structure engineer would say, well, you can displace the bars. Somebody could have asked us this. Why was there no query? To which the fixer might say, well, you could have shown this on your drawing. They would have known. And the structure engineer says, but we don't design these. The steelwork fabricator does, and the main contractor supplies it to you. At which point the main contractor will certainly pipe up and say, guess what guys, this is not our problem. Now, arguably a small note on the structure engineer's drawing could have prevented this just to alert the steelwork fixer, you need to ask. If you haven't got the details of this, you need, you need them to fix it. So onto the expert role. Often what we do, our, our biggest deliverable is a, is a report. Now clearly that needs to be more engaging than an MBS specification. We know that it needs to be succinct, clear, independent and well presented. But one of the easiest ways for us to provide clarity is to use visual input alongside the words. A picture paints a thousand words. So I'm going to go into a bit of an example here. So this is a school which Philip will also be talking about later on. There were, there were several issues to look at. So the 3D design model was built to review the design. So one of the easiest ways for us to demonstrate how uh, a design is working. So this is the same model, an extract just showing columns. One of, the, one of the easiest ways to demonstrate this is using uh, the utilization factor. So just to explain, that's the degree to which a member has been used. So for example, if a column has a utilization factor of 0.9, it means it's been used to 90% of its capacity. So if it's the utilization factor is one or higher, it's failing. So if you look at that example, the, the scale on the left, uh, red indicates greater than one. And you can see there several columns highlighted in red. So we can then take that and use that to give some graphical output. So in this case, we're explaining the columns from first uh, level one to roof are failing due to moment in the weak axis. Now, I don't want to assume I know what weak axis is. I don't want to assume that you do. So I've, I've added the little sketch to clarify what the weak axis and strong axis of a column section are. In the same location, the column at the lower level and again, a little explanation of why it's failing. So nice and clear graphic, graphical explanation. We can also use tables to provide clarity. So in this case, I've summarized the situation with all the columns. I've used red, amber, green um, banding to, to put the results into, and a little key at the bottom to explain what that means. So red means the column fails, amber, it requires a more rigorous check, et cetera. And again, I've explained what the utilization ratio actually means, as I explained to you earlier. So it's a really clear summary of the overall situation. So you can see in this case that 46 columns are failing, 14%, but another 122 need a more rigorous check. We can then take this for our conclusions as to whether the original designer uh, met their obligations in the project or not from this summary. On the same, exa on the same um, example project, uh, this just shows the flow of work um, looking at the brace bays that's providing natural stability to the building. 
starting from the, the initial markup of the potential problem due to the 3D model, which confirmed there was a problem, due to the, the hand sketch showing potential way to resolve this. We need to communicate this, this flow within our report as well, and the sketch has really helped to do that. So something we get asked an awful lot is what's the right answer? What's the correct answer? Unfortunately, it's not that straightforward because these are complex models. They're assembled by applying a set of parameters and constraints or boundaries. So for example, you set the parameters of the material strength and behavior, the, uh, the way the supports behave and the, the way the loading is applied because there's, there's, there's several ways to approach any problem. And some of these will be more conservative than others. Some will be more efficient than others, and some will definitely have weaknesses. And part of our role is to unpick what other answers there are available within the acceptable boundaries. So delivery excellence is the HKA unified approach to project success, and it combines both the framework for running a project and systems for ensuring the quality of deliverables. Now, a really key part of this for us is the peer review. So every report we write is reviewed by another expert. But equally importantly, it's reviewed by a member of our expert support team, such as Sharon. This gives us real confidence that a non-engineer can understand the output because it's been reviewed by a non-engineer who can query it. So just to summarize, we work really hard to communicate clearly in our deliverables to you. And hopefully I've explained some of the challenges for us in doing so. We really don't mind when you ask us to clarify points. In fact, we encourage it. We know that as engineers, we have to adopt a technical mindset and flip from that to an expert mindset. So, and, and not only that, but also that the legal position may be at odds to how, how we're thinking technically. And that's part of the fascinating work we do. Often understanding the legal basis allows us to be more helpful and it's all about communication and cooperation. So I've um, covered some of the challenges in reporting. I'm now gonna pass you on to Philip, who will cover some of the other challenges I've been in the expert role as a structural engineer. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Good evening. I'm Philip Ebbertson, a technical director with HKA, and similar to John, I'm a fellow of the Institute of Civil Engineers and a fellow of the Institution of Structural Engineers, and I have something in the order of 40 years experience working as a chartered engineer. So I wanted to talk to you briefly this evening about how the challenges of the expert, you know, move forward into joint meetings and cross-examination. The challenge is, uh, Albert Einstein summed it up, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. I quite like the addition of Mark Twain, I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. I think that's relevant to what we're talking about tonight in that as technical experts, it's very easy for us to, to go into a lot of forensic examination, which quite often isn't really what we need to be doing. We need to be communicating. We're looking for a pragmatic solution, not an academic exercise. So, the joint meeting of experts is, I, we often refer to CPR, Civil Procedure Rules Part 35. I won't go into it in detail. It, it highlights the duty of the expertise to the court within matters of their expertise. And the requirement is to provide independent expert evidence unin uninfluenced by the pressures of litigation. So the joint meetings are not mandatory and the court may instruct them at any time. We're, we're finding increasingly that we have an early joint meeting of experts to discuss the issues that we actually want to discuss in the joint meeting of experts, which is often a good way of 
narrowing down the, the issue so we understand the questions we are being asked to deliberate upon. The meetings are without prejudice. They are confidential. They are only released when both experts sign the joint statement and then it can be taken into evidence in court. The joint statement has a two principal function. It helps reduce court time by filtering down into the matters that really are in dispute. If we can agree matters that we're both generally in agreement with, the court doesn't need to deliberate on them. But the joint statement is equally important to counsel because that gives them an indication of the matters that they need to prepare and to prepare to cross-examine them. In practice, you know, earlier this evening, Hanos and John showed an example of a structural frame analysis and introduced you to the concept of utilization ratios. That case was taken from a, a recent case in the High Court, which I gave evidence on about a year ago now. My counterpart had taken, undertaken structural analysis and we discussed our joint findings. You notice, or perhaps I hope you can see in the lower diagram there, the expert for the other side was finding utilizations in the order of 1.9 and 3.2. That is to say it is working three times at the capacity of that structural element, which by any measure is quite difficult to contemplate. So in our joint meeting, we agreed the design was deficient, but we did not agree the extent of the deficiency. This building is a structural steel frame with masonry infill wall panels. The masonry is brittle, and yet the building showed no physical evidence of distress. I presented that our analysis had found utilization in some of the column elements in the order of 1.4, not 3. This is not compliant with the code of practice, but when the factors of safety are taken into consideration, it would appear to be safe in service. But if utilization was of two and three of, the, of capacity were occurring, I thought the building would be showing signs of some distress. In this matter, the claimant sought substantial costs for extensive remediation work prescribed by its engineers. And the defendant, who I was advising, proposed an alternative with a lesser scope of work. The disputed matter based on the joint statement, council prepared and submitted to court that the costs claimed were disproportionate and prepared to cross-examine. Moving on, again, just a reminder, as we become pointed in a moment, the duty to the court and the requirement to give uninfluenced and objective evidence. And the purpose of cross-examination is to test the evidence in the expert reports present and by both counsel seek to advance their position and question the strength of the other side. The experts must be fully cognizant of their own report and that of the other side. And that position of strength for the expert is in their own report. They will repeatedly rely on their report. A colleague of mine re relates that to holding the tea when playing squash and come back to your report. And opposing counsel will often try to divert the expert and introduce uncertainty. In a recent arbitration hearing, cross-examining cross -examining counsel asked me to restrict my commentary to yes, no answers. I had to advise the tribunal that to help the tribunal, a fuller response was necessary. 
the dispute outlined in the preceding slide moved on into the High Court. And my counterpart advised that in respect of the building design, the design was deficient. And in his, in his opinion, the claimant was entitled to remediate the building to be fully compliant with current building regulation. Remembering the objectivity, I advised the court of the works that would be required to resent, render the building compliant with regulations at the time of the design, a solution was available. And if the court's decision was the building should be made compliant with current regulations, another alternative solution was available. My counterpart also advised the court that he had relied on his own model and formed his opinion. He had not reviewed my analysis. I, I went on to advise that I had found from my own analysis, the modeling of the frame connections had quite a significant impact on those utilization ratios that we were all pondering upon. I considered based on my experience, the severity of the deficiencies asserted by a claimant would have led to physical damage. And we had no visible evidence of that damage. I agreed with cross-examining counsel that the building may have not have been subjected to the full extent of the design loads. However, I considered the building had been in service for 12 years at the time of the hearing. And in that time, it had been subjected to severe winter storms and the masonry remained uncracked with one minor exception. The doors and windows remained fully functional. And that is often one of the first tests that the doors and the windows don't fit. During the cross-examination, my counterpart weakened his position. Having given evidence on other matters, he conceded he was not in possession of sufficient information and could not support some of the opinions he expressed in his own report. Counsel for the defendant submitted the claim that remedial costs were excessive. But in that same High Court hearing, in cross-examination, the counsel introduced additional photographs during cross-examination that I hadn't seen before we went into court. And the council embarked on a series of rapid fire questions. Photograph one, what do you see? Photograph two, what do you see? And after about three or four photographs, I had to stop the council and ask him to confirm, were we both looking at the same photographs? He seemed to be de describing something else. At that point, the judge recognized that the bundle handed to me was not numbered. And the judge drew that line of, questioning to a very rapid close. Litigation hearings are by their nature adversarial and in cross-examination, we must remain calm and professional. I use that little cartoon just to highlight the dilemma because looking from different sides of an argument, we both see something different. And that is often you know, the crux of what we do to try to focus in and finding that mutual agreement. So in the past few minutes, we have considered one component part of quite a lengthy hearing with 18 expert witnesses, 15 witnesses of fact. The trial involved a claimant, a respondent, 10 co-respondents and a 15 week trial. So it was quite a marathon undertaking. And the collaboration between the various experts was quite a vital part of the preparation. Just to bring this section to a close, I would like to just quickly look at the way a judge views expert evidence. In a recent case, Thomas Barnes versus Blackwell, Blackburn for a council, the judges language in the summing up is interesting. He stated that the climate structural engineering expert entered into a forensic fray and to a larger extent than the defendants expert, failing to make a distinction between two design errors 
their secretary of bus station. So this meant the weight attached to the evidence of the claimed structural engineer suffered as a, as a result. And this expert also included argument in his additional supplementary report. In contrast, the judge remarked that the defendant's structural engineering expert was careful and cautious in her approach. And as a consequence, the judge favored the defendant's structural engineering expert over the claim. I think that highlights the need to help the court understand the issues and not try to climb them with too much new in argumentative information. That draws uh, my section on cross-examination and expert reports to a close. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, Sarah, who talk to you on the, the value of technical input into design disputes. Thank you, Philip. So I'm going to talk about uh, collaboration, essentially. So in the digital department, which is where I sit, uh, looking at building information models, they're always building information models designed by either an architect, a structural engineer, or a building services engineer when it comes to built assets like buildings work with chemical engineers as well. I've just forgotten ones in the audience, so I feel bad. Um, the point is, it involves a lot of collaboration. So the engineers have to collaborate whilst they're designing it, and we may have to collaborate whilst looking at structural engineering problems, potentially, depending on the impact to other designs. And the other thing we collaborate over is uh, cost and time. So if claims involve uh, delay and quantum, we then have to consider the technical uh, in context of those claims as well. And it involves us all working together, which luckily at HPA we can do quite seamlessly. So on the screen, I've put an example of a project we worked on where some steel was very simply delivered to site late. And our job was to work with the structural engineers, me using the model to pick out the bits of steel. Luckily, everything was tagged, so I can very quickly find it. I can find what bits of steel in amongst millions of pieces of steel were late. I can then ask the structural engineers, what impact does this have on the structure? What can you do to mitigate this delay? And then Konstantinos can then, in our delay team, analyze the impact to the critical path. The result of this collaborative working environment gives us a much better result than have we just looked at it in silos. We can consider the impact of the missing steel, both to time and to structure, and we can tell the lawyers what potentially could have been done to mitigate said delay. And it gives us a much better result when we come to actually present the evidence as well. One of the biggest things we look at in our jobs in construction claims is looking at design change and variations. So here I put an example of how things can change between different des design revisions and potentially what we can do as a team. Again, very similar, collaborate and consider our works packages in context of each other. This is one of my favorite examples because obviously a structural engineer has gone to great lengths to put a hole in the beam. And then the MEP guys have just decided they're not gonna move their stuff. So if we get a claim like this that involves coordination and clash detection, and obviously impact of time as most of these things will have an impact on, we can again work together and ascertain what happened, when it happened, where it happened, and get, it helps give us, our, our lawyers, our instructing solicitors, helps them understand as well when we give them uh, graphics like this. One of my last examples is uh, 4D. So 
we've considered design changes, we've considered uh, clash detection, and we've considered aspects of design like missing steel. So things that I've worked with all of the members of the panel on. And 4D is a combination of building information models and time. So sometimes when we have a delay and we have a building information model, we might combine the two and come up with a result, something like this. So we can look at say the as planned versus the as built, or we might wanna look at say two different experts opinion on a critical path. So especially in structural uh, disputes, which I'm the only non-structural engineer on the panel, I personally uh, think a picture really is worth a thousand words. And if I was a lawyer, I definitely want something like this. So that's me done on uh, why we collaborate as a team and what benefits that have. I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Konstantinos, who's gonna be talking about delay. Thank you very much, Sarah. So my name is Konstantinos Leitos. Uh, I'm a delay analyst and the director at HKA, and I work as part of our delay team at HKA. So I'm gonna briefly talk today uh, about how a delay expert and a technical expert uh, can collaborate and work together as part of their uh, respective analysis. And um, I will first start by um, explaining briefly what it is that we as delay analysts actually do. Um, so I presume that most of you will be familiar with the Society of Construction Law Delay and Disruption Protocol, of which the second edition was published in 2017. And within the SEL protocol, there are many and six primarily delay analysis methodologies that are detailed therein. Now, talking about the characteristics of each specific delay analysis method is a separate topic uh, and discussion of its own. But um, the point I would like to make is that many of these methods would be some of these methods would require some sort of as-built data or factual matrix uh, to be collated in order to conduct the analysis. So assuming that the delay analyst selects uh, to go that way, I have drawn a little sketch and a little diagram of how we would typically conduct the analysis as delay experts. So the first step would be to conduct the as-built or factual uh, program, as we call it. So um, in, this, in this step, we typically collate uh, all the as-built information that we can from all the project records that we get. So this would include everything from monthly progress reports, daily diaries, site photographs, uh, delivery schedules, uh, minutes of meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and essentially pictorially show how, uh, what happened and when, and when its construction activity actually took, uh, took place. Um, then, as Sarah mentioned, we now have the capacity to even show the as-built program in a 3D or 4D visual way, uh, which is also an effective way to convey the message to the tribunal. Uh, and then the next step would be for the delay uh, expert to perform what we call the critical path analysis. And again, um, in the time available, I, I only wanted to read the definition that the SCL protocol gives about the uh, critical path. So it defines it as the longest sequence of activities through a project network from start to finish, the sum of whose durations determines the overall project duration. So in this step, what the delay analyst typically does is identify which specific works of the projects were critical at each point in time, and therefore um, how the project was delayed and from which works it was delayed. And then after that, we move on to the causation analysis, which is essentially where most of the collaboration between the delay expert and the technical experts, include, including the structural expert, occurs. So for example, it could be the case that the delay analyst has identified a cause of delay which is highly technical. This could be a design change or a design submittal, for example. Um, and uh, potentially, technical input would be required in, at that stage from a structural engineering expert. So just to give you an example of how this could occur. So let's take uh, a building project uh, as an example, which was ongoing from the 1st of January 16 to the 1st of January 18. Based on the diagram and the methodology that we saw earlier, the delay expert has already collated the as-built program uh, based on all the available information, and if possible and applicable, presented it in a 3D, 4D visual way as well. And based on his or her analysis, the delay expert has formed the view and the opinion that the critical path ran through the foundation works of the building project uh, at the start of the project from the 1st of January 16 
to the 1st of May 16. Then the critical path switch to the superstructure works between May 16 um, and December 16, and then on and on through the facade works between December 16 and March 17, through the MEP finishing works through March uh, 17 and October 17, and finally through the testing and commissioning works until the end of the project. Now, with regards to the critical foundation works, which were uh, ongoing at the start uh, and between January and May, the delay expert has identified that 30 calendar days of delay were caused uh, due to the late progress of these works. The delay expert has reviewed the available documents and correspondence and has identified that a specific design submittal, let's call it design submittal number 110, uh, uh, and the approval of that by the owner caused the 30 calendar day delay to the construction foundation. However, the correspondence further indicates that the owner in turn alleged that in order to approve this particular design submittal, the contractor ought to have submitted a 3D structural model first. And to make things even more complicated, as it turned out, the contractor never actually submitted the 3D structural model to the owner, but the owner finally approved the design of the foundations after 30 days anyway, and without the model having ever been submitted. So the following question would then arise as part of this story. Did the non-submittal of, th of the 3D structural model by the contractor to the owner delay the design process or not? So this is a typical example where the delay expert would need uh, technical input by the structural expert in order to be able to answer this question. Because on the one hand, to answer this question would require significant structural engineering expertise for somebody to actually open this structural, this structural model, examine it compare, it, compare it against the design submittal, and see if the model was actually important for the structural integrity of the building and for approving this design submittal. On the other hand, this is a very important question that a delay expert would need to be answered because this is an issue that potentially did cause delay to the project. So that's a typical example where uh, collaboration may occur between uh, delay and technical experts. Um, and just, although this list is uh, by no means, uh, it's, not, it's not exhaustive, but based on my experience, uh, other instances where such a co cooperation would be needed is, for example, if design changes, late design submittals, approvals, or approvals of structural models have occurred, um, any type of reinforcement fixing issues uh, uh, involving the quality and the density of rebar, potential rebar issues affecting productivity or delaying the project, uh, also, concrete pouring issues, for example, the curing time required would be a typical issue and how the curing time would affect uh, the concrete pouring sequence of the works. And many other issues, including clash detection, materials issues, uh, feasibility issues, etc. So just to sum up, um, the delay evidence can be significantly improved by uh, technical input when necessary. And once the delay expert has identified the root of the critical path and has formed his or her opinion on what has been critical, it is very common that the technical and the delay teams will collaborate in order to identify the causes of critical delay, particularly if these relate to highly technical issues like design changes, for example. Um, it is further added that the, a 3D and 4D visualization can be a very uh, uh, effective way in order for delay and structural experts to communicate and also a good way to convey the final message to the tribunal and all the parties involved in the dispute. And finally, I would like to also stress the importance um, of an expert staying within or his or her area of expertise when applicable and seeking input from experts of other disciplines uh, if this is required. So thank you. And this concludes our presentation. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Konstantinos, and to the whole panel. Um, does anyone have any questions? And I can come round with the microphone if they do. Yes? Hi, thanks. I've got a question for John. You mentioned that there's sometimes issues with um, not communicating information between drawings and the specification. I just wonder if you've got any examples of issues that have arisen from that lack of communication out with the one that you gave in your presentation. Uh, 
uh, I can't think of any specific example other than the, the general one of, of specifications being ignored. Um, and just, just have learned over the years that actually that information goes on to drawings, then that it's more likely to be incorporated. This is a question for Philip. So you spoke about joint meetings and the collaboration required there with the other expert. And so I just wondered what your experience was when you're trying to collaborate with the expert on the other side and find areas of agreement. What do you do when you're poles apart and you can't find any areas of agreement? Thank you. I, I should point out first that we are not in this a joint. That was interesting. Yeah, I was just about to say that the point of the joint experts meeting is not to try to negotiate or to find an agreement. It's to establish where we agree and where we don't agree. So we, we do produce a schedule exactly setting out points of agreement, points of disagreement, and that has to then be presented into court and those other matters that are disputed. We do find with some experts that they just do not agree on anything. They want to go to court and have a fight and we just have to be prepared for that. And as we said, it's adversarial and looking from opposite sides of a question, sometimes there are answers that have to be considered from both sides. No. Fill you with some confidence we did. <laughs> See how it goes. Um, one question is expert witnesses how much of your current experience and work is involved in designing for real life projects as opposed to post the event um, advice on forensic cause of failure or anything else? And does it actually matter? Certainly from my personal perspective, I was um, actively involved in preparation of design and project management, delivery of projects, right through to the end of 2018. So I've been involved full time in expert work for about three, four years now. As an expert, the majority of our work is at first reviewing the documents, trying to find the thread of how the design was developed. We then undertake some of our own design occasion, not, not in every case, but quite often we do sufficient calculations on our own to try and develop our opinion. But as HKA experts, it's not our role to design a solution. Again, we're advising the court, but we're doing sufficient design to be in a position to advise the court on the requirements of the design. Anything to add, John? No, no, I think you've covered it. Right. Um, so my work involves looking at a lot of uh, models and essentially software. So every so often I have to go in and reuse that software. So occasionally making models and just keeping up that skill. Just because you're not designing, I guess, you guys, especially John, anyone who's sitting on boards, who's doing examinations, you're keeping up with all the current knowledge and trends through that. So you've already got years of design experience and then you're, you're doing this, keeping your skills relevant. Um, so me, slightly different, obviously, um, but software changes every year. So I have to go in, check out what's changed and also apply that to say retrospective projects. So say, for example, if I'm looking at a structural model from Revit from 2012, 
uh, that's always a really interesting question because what did the software do at that point in time? What was it even capable of doing? Was I using it at that point? So um, keeping skills current is obviously important as experts, but we, I think we do a lot of it just in the day-to-day -day of our jobs, surprisingly. So. I would also, sorry, I would also like to add one more comment. Um, not only do we keep, do we, uh, keep in touch with all the development in the industry, but I will just take you to the opposite end. Sometimes we have to look into standards that probably were in effect, well, for me personally was, I was in school. So there's a whole lot of spe spectrum of um, investigation into um, new standards and old standards. And that will depend on, on the case and uh, what design standards were in, in effect with a specific project. Uh, yeah, turning that one on its head, really. Uh, I'm a geotechnical engineer, so it's a little bit different to uh, what you guys do. But um, I increasingly find that errors occurring because of basic principles that are forgotten. Uh, and an overreliance on uh, automation. And I noticed you, your example had columns overstressed by three or four times. And is that something that, well, firstly, should have, I don't know whether there's a giant design change, which, which obviously would, would excuse it to some extent. But is that something that should be picked up just by a, a common knowledge of what's happening behind the screen and, the, and the calc how the calculation is formed, rather than um, an error in, in not pressing the right buttons on the machine? It, it is uh, a quite common problem that some engineers, particularly younger engineers, tend to accept the output of the computer without questioning it. And that can lead to problems. But to put a different perspective on that, I'm currently involved in a fatal accident inquiry where I was asked to comment on the quality of the design produced in 1983. So being old enough, I, I set about designing it as I would have done in 1983 and found that within you know, a sensible margin of error, the, the design did actually work. My counterpart actually put the, the frame through structural analysis software and found that it didn't work. And we, we had an exchange of views. And it, I had to point out that in 1983, I didn't have a computer sitting on my desk and that kind of software available. We had this conversation via conference call. And a few months later, I was at uh, an Academy of Experts black tie dinner. I was introduced to the president of the Institute of Structural Engineers at that time who introduced himself by saying, I know you, you're opposing me in this matter, which you know, broke my eye, certainly. But yeah, sometimes we try to put too much science into structural engineering. And I agree with you, John, that there does need to be a measure of practical reason and review of the answers we put out. So uh, just following on from that, obviously, as a non-structural engineer, I don't use the software that I use for, say, load analysis. The issue I see, especially in the world of building information modeling, is that the software needs to be driven by competent professionals. And uh, the risk of over-reliance on that software is incredibly worrying um especially because say if you look at the autodesk term of use so autodesk all the software i've shown today in my slides all the autodesk software you're lucky to get the cost of your license back if there's a defect within the software and i think um lawyers obviously know that you're, you're not going to get much back from them 
So it's incredibly worrying if you do use that software, it results in an error. Um, I think there's actually a case from the US where it's happened in a quantum uh, capacity where a calculation has been done incorrectly. And again, there's very little recourse for over-reliance on software. So I guess um, back to the old skills of just actually checking things manually. So uh, yes, technology is great and you can use building information models to help digitally rehearse projects. But obviously if the design fundamentally is wrong, then that's not gonna be great. You're probably gonna end up back in the same position had you not used the software at all. So hopefully that answers that. Um, I think that's a really brilliant note to end on actually, because I think the, that question um, kind of gave full insight into the complexities that we deal with as, as structural engineers, but also as experts because of things changing over time. So um, I think to come to the end of your question, Shai, was what's the difference when we're looking at projects that are live, um, which we do get to look at at times, um, sometimes we're looking at state-of-the-art type design situations that are happening um, and it's about who knows what and it's about carrying out that sort of research versus something looking back to 1983 or whatever year it is, finding out what was in practice at the time, getting into the mindset of an engineer at that time and understanding and bounding out that problem of, of um, as John alluded to, what's the window of correct solutions and where does that lie within that or does it lie within that um, and I, I, I think that's a really nice demonstration of how um, structural engineering experts work but also structural engineers work and um, all of those things that we have to take into account um, so thank you all for brilliant questions and um, thank you very much for coming um, I hope that you have time to stay and continue some of these conversations with the team um, I, I think I speak for my team um, when I say that part of what drew us to life as an engineer is the variety of problems that we have to solve and the collaboration involved in solving them um, and the fact that no two working days are the same. Um, we've now all found ourselves in the realm of expert work um, for which the same can be said to be true, um, I think. Um, so we hope this evening's given you useful insight into both sides of that job. Um, and the analysis, the communication, the articulation and the collaboration um, required to deliver um, the work that we do. Um, I hope it's also shown the passion and expertise of my team. Um, and obviously, finally, we hope it might one day prove useful to you um, should you come across a structural engineering um, issue in one of your matters. Um, so thank you again to the panel. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, on that note, anyone would like a drink or some nibbles, they are behind us. Thank you very much.